Applebaum, have you heard about WebNet? WebNet. WebNet. She is the person actually behind this, and she is this uh, psychologist. <laughs> or she worked with the psychology department in cognitive sciences. But I mean, this is my message to our IT students, is that you don't have to be only, you know, programmer in order to do something useful. So a lot of people in other fields are also doing something useful. So uh, Christiana from uh, Princeton University, and she is also participating within the project uh, uh, through the uh, Berlin Academy of Sciences as a core uh, uh, partner in this project. Are we ready? So start Skype, and then we wait over the, you don't have the start sign. No starts. I will tell actually no. Oh, the problem was from our side. Oh, oh hi, Christiana. No, 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 should I just Skype now? Yeah, okay, Skype, Skype. Okay, that's good. No, no, actually it's, it's clear, I mean, just speakers were off. Uh, Skype is good. Uh, if we, we, it's better, you need to be here. Right? Okay, just a minute. Let's start first try with the with the Webex again. Okay, I have to, I have to restart my Webex. Okay, thank you. Does it take time? Does it take time? Uh, let's see how do I start Webex. Wait, I have to start the Webex again. Just a minute. Um. um Yeah, I will. I'm just opening another window. Something about where did. It's for English. You remember my presentation about the Arabic authority. Um, so this was done uh, for uh, English. And it's ready. It's much open. And it's open source for free. Now, also Christiana started a project about the Arabic language. But she did stop, so you can start asking her uh, this time about... Word net is different. Okay, I have a web app. Where it is different. Uh, well, okay. mm, let's say that there is no difference. I mean, uh, for non experts, for uh, experts, yes, there is a difference. But. Because it doesn't like the camera for two purposes. Mm. Now, it should, now it should be okay. Yes, okay. Now let's go to home. Share your screen. Okay. Call. Share screen. Share full screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You got it? Yes. No. Do you have my slides? Yes. How do I minimize you? You have the full slides? Uh, what's the head? Just max 
maximize your window and minimize ours. We will see you more Okay. Okay, is that good enough? Is that big enough? It's fine. Is that all right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so shall I start? Yes, yes. Do you see us, Christine? Do you see us? Yeah. Yes, I can see you. So I took the opportunity while you were busy with Anton preparing I, to introduce you. So I was talking about you and we admit uh, Okay. So uh, and let's say, let's say good morning for you because, you know, this is, for us it's like close to the uh, afternoon and uh, for you it's the morning, right? Yes, yes. So, so good morning. Yeah, good morning everybody and I am sorry I cannot be in person but I am certainly we will meet sooner or later and um, I will do my best to um, convey my ideas long distance. So I would like to talk about uh, something you may have touched on already and I apologize if it's um, boring in places. Um, so my topic is the, um, the unification of the, the mapping of abstract concepts, formal concepts and words in a language. Um, this is based on work I've done for many years, and in particular in the Kyoto project um, that was finished uh, recently, and that you will hear about from P. Crossan uh, tomorrow. So, uh, you can phrase this problem very simply by saying ontology versus lexicon. And ontology, of course, has roots in philosophy and is now, again, fashionable as a skeleton for knowledge representation. Uh, it's a formal representation of concepts and the relations that hold among the concepts. Uh, in lang uh, ontology is language independent and is not uh, concerned with the fact that not all languages label with a word all um, concepts that are possible. And ontology, of course, is man-made. Um, it is something people thought up already in Aristotle times. And because it is man-made and not natural, there are necessarily multiple, different, and competing ontologies. And I will say a few words about the ones, the one that we have adopted for Kyoto, and that I would recommend also for Sierra. Um, ontologies are desirable because they are formal and mathematical contracts, constructs, and allow one to uh, perform simple reasoning and inferencing. Uh, processes over text. The lexicon, by contrast, has its roots in language, in linguistics. Uh, it's a semantic description of uh, all the words or lexical units in a language. It's necessarily uh, dependent on a language. A given lexicon describes just one language. And um, fortunately, there is a lot of overlap across languages, but not complete overlap. Um, because a lexicon is natural and um, given by a, created by a language speaker community, uh, we cannot argue about its contents. We can argue about how to represent the content, contents, but we cannot say this is or this is not the word. Uh, unlike an ontology, a lexicon is somewhat messy, it's not as regular, and even though uh, there are very clear patterns as to which concepts are lexicalized in a language, and the patterns are often broken and not always easy to make out. So why do we want to link an ontology and a lexicon? Well, uh, we want to relate the natural language expressions, the words of language, to formal meaning representations, because we want to make it possible for computers to interpret words and also to interpret text involving words. Um, in order to do this um, cross-lingually, we can link lexicons and word words in particular for many languages, perhaps all languages, to a single shared top ontology. The top ontology provides information about the most abstract general concepts uh, in, as I said, a language-independent formal axiomatic format and um, enables computers to uh, manipulate these. I already mentioned briefly that uh, the lexicon of choice, and I'm somewhat biased here, <laughs> is the one I helped uh, construct, namely WordNet. 
Um, WebNet has the advantage that it is, first of all, very large, and that it is structured um, already along the lines of a formal ontology. When we started to build WebNet 25 years ago, we stole quite a few ideas from uh, Aristotle and also from psycholinguistics. I won't have time to go into this now, but um, the claim is that um, WordNet has some similarity to how people might manipulate, store, and access words in their minds. So uh, WordNet is a big semantic network, or in computer science speak, a directed acyclic graph. It currently exists already for over 60 languages, including Arabic. Um, I give you some references in a moment. Um, and many, though not all, of the WordNets are links are linked to the Princeton original English WordNet that uh, we created here. However, Princeton WordNet is not an ontology, um, though it bears some similarities. Um, the structure of WordNet is compatible with the formal ontology, which makes mapping a little bit easier, and importantly, allows for the extension to a domain-specific terminology, and this is important for Sierra, as it was important for Kyoto. Uh, WordNet is very easy to use for automatic systems, which is why it is very popular currently in natural language processing. And uh, WordNet encodes two very important properties of natural language, which are easy to handle by human speakers, but very difficult for machines. And these are polysemy and synonymy. Uh, polysemy and synonymy are flip sides of the same coin, um, namely many-to-many -many mappings of word forms, the strings, the sequences of letters or characters in a written language, to word meaning. Um, synonymy in WordNet um, is handled simply by the creation of synonym sets or syn sets, which is an unordered set of words which all express the same concept. So here are three syn sets in curly brackets. One for a verb, he hit, beat, strike, three different word forms, all expressing the same meaning, the same concept, big and large, an adjective syn set, and Q a line, a noun syn set. All of this could actually also be a verb syn set. So each syn set uh, is unique and it expresses a unique concept. Polysemy, the other many to one uh, or many to many um, uh, mappings in language, is um, the multiple meaning of a single string. So a word form, uh, like table in the example here, has at least four different meanings and um, it is therefore uh, to be found in four different set sets. Um, you can simply say polysemy, n fold polysemy is reflected in n number of set sets in WordNet. So what is uh, the net of WordNet? Well, the net is, uh, uh, arises because the set sets are interlinked into a gigantic network. The network um, is formed by mostly bidirectional pointers or labeled arcs. Uh, that express or stand for semantic relations. So the main relations, which as I already said, we really took from Aristotle, are the is a relation or hyponymy or subsumption or superordinate relation, and many names for it, as in oak and tree, oak is a kind of tree, or car and vehicle, car is a kind of vehicle, and the part of the relation or veronomy or passive relation. So flower core has petals, or conversely, petal is part of the flower. The car has tire, or tire is part of the car, and so forth. There are other relations that are more subtle, perhaps, and uh, more difficult, but are encoded, that uh, link verb um, and events, or adjectives and properties. Um, here's a quick picture of the nouns in WordNet. You can see the tree on the left. Um, going from since a cruiser, squad, car, and so forth, all the way up to conveyance, transport, and in fact, could even go further up to um, entity. And on the right, um, you see the merriment, the part of relations, which themselves, of course, can be structured with the is a relation. 
Um, so this is a quick, uh, simplified cutout of the network. Here is the data model. You have the concepts uh, in green on the left and the lexicon on the right. And uh, the only thing you really need to notice is all the way on the left are the relations like kind of or part of. And the other thing you should notice is that uh, the lexicon is much smaller than the concept inventory. And that is because the words have many meanings. So bank in the lexicon, the word, goes to two different kinds of concepts, one in the financial institution and one the side of the river. So this is, the again, the phenomenon of polysemy. Here are some WordNet stats from WordNet 3.0. We actually have uh, recently released 3.1, but the statistics have not changed much. Just to give you an idea of how large WordNet is, um, look at the right-hand column, the sin sets, 82,000 for nouns, 13,000 for verbs, and so forth, for a total of 117,000. Um, notice also that, also that nouns really make up the bulk of the lexicon and of the sin sets. And um, we have only very few adverbs and uh, relatively few verbs and adjectives. Um, you can also see in the middle column the word forms, which are of course many to one because many for synsets, because many word forms are in one given synsets. Synset. But again, you notice that nouns remain up. So nouns are really the meat of the language. Uh, as I said, there are many different word nets for well over 60 languages now, and um, I led the effort for an Arabic word net uh, that was funded by the U.S. government uh, a few years ago. Um, it is the, the project has finished, um, but uh, Arabic word net is still maintained and continue to be, be developed at the uh, Polytechnic University of Barcelona under the direction of Rasio Rodriguez. And once in a while we talk about um, uh, reviving this effort, and this might be something uh, we could aim for uh, in Sierra, uh, perhaps write a proposal to uh, continue developing Arabic women. Here's a partial bibliography, um, which I will, you have already, and I can send you more, this reference to the Arabic WordNet. Um, the coverage of the Arabic WordNet, WordNet was uh, 10,000 concepts. Uh, base concepts refer to concepts at the middle level of the hierarchical tree structure. Very common words, very frequent words, that also have a lot of connections to other uh, terms, either super or subordinate terms. Um, we also focused on named entities and the semi-automatic extension. Some of this work is still going on in Barcelona. Um, at the end of the project, coverage uh, was as follows. We had uh, over 11,000 synsets and over 23,000 words, so about two words per synset, as you can see. In the box below is a breakdown by part of speech, adjective, noun, nouns again being by far the most, um, the largest um, uh, component. Uh, R stands for adverb, very small, adverbs, uh, the second largest component. And notice that we had a lot of linked entities which were a focus of the work. Um, we also developed software in the context of Arabic WordNet, which is available and can be used uh, in the future. We have a lexicographer's web interface, which allows people to work even off-site and construct uh, more synsets and more connections for Arabic WordNet, a user's web interface, and something called a word spotter, which um, is software aimed at uh, detecting lexical units and running text for uh, integration into Arabic WordNet. I don't really have time to go into that in detail, but here are some references. Here's the web interface which, as I said, allows um, people to uh, extend uh, Arabic with that. Um, the user's web interface, where users can consult Arabic WordNet, search for words, roots, synsets, and corresponding English words and synsets. Uh, and it has a virtual keyboard for users who do not have um, access to an Arabic keyboard. Uh, a word spotter, 
again here is the uh, reference to um, the university, the Polytechnic University in uh, Barcelona, uh, which is based on the Aram of STEMA, a morphological analyzer, and I think it performs rather well in identifying uh, additional words uh, or words in general uh, for natural language processing in a running text. Um, and here is the reference to the browser. Um, the semi-automatic extension of Arabic WordNet that is going on that I already alluded to, um, and I don't really have time um, to go into right now, but it is again an active uh, research, or it was until recently, and something we might want to consider integrating and extending uh, in Sierra. Uh, let me go back quickly um, to the World Net Meets Ontology theme of my talk. Um, so to combine these two different entities, or these two different uh, constructs, a lexicon, World Net and the ontology, uh, we want to map synsets, which we loosely term concepts, to axioms in the top ontology. And we can profit from the existing ontology-like World Net structure, for inheritance. In other words, we uh, develop and work very carefully on the top structure which contains the very general concepts, and then we rely on WordNet's encoding of the ISA relation to hang from this top context uh, concepts more specific context con con sorry, <laughs> concepts as far down as um, we might. Um, the ontology of choice that we used for Kyoto, and that was actually chosen by uh, my colleague Amanda Hicks, who will also be part of the Sierra project, and who is a, a trained philosopher, an ontologist, and logician, is Guarino and Welty's uh, Dolce Light Plus, which seems seem to her like the best candidate, and also importantly is consistent with other ontologies. Um, so it is not necessarily um, that uh, one exclude, uh, excludes all the others. Um, Amanda noticed and uh, worked on the fact that uh, important, the crucial important ontological distinctions must be drawn at the top level because, as I said, they will be incorporated down into the lower levels. And any mistake, any logical mistake, or any mistake in the representation of the very abstract top concepts, concepts can have um, nasty consequences um, an assumption is that many top or near the top uh, concepts are universally lexicalized and that the middle and especially the lower levels are language specific. This is intuitively convincing when we come to terminology, um, languages tend to differ uh, quite a bit from one another. In the middle ontology, so words like car, house, food, person, and so forth. Uh, most languages have um, lexical equivalents. The middle level is also important because it includes the high frequency words. Um, so uh, let me go to the top ontology, which as I said is really the most important one from the point of view of design, and uh, one wants to draw important distinctions right there. Um, distinction, distinctions have to be drawn among endurance, which are entities, and in language are usually nouns uh, on the one hand, and endurance on the other hand, and which are you know, events, and in language are lexicalized as verbs, and uh, thirdly, qualities, which are in a language expressed with adjectives. Um, so um, the top ontology must accommodate the representation of domain relevant processes, states, entities, and qualities in a in the ontology further down, and support the identification in the text so that the reasoning of the text can be performed accurately. Uh, the knowledge in the ontology must um, pertain to um, entities and in particular to their essential and rigid properties. Um, rigidity and essence are important between the, for the distinction between types and roles. So types of things are really what the is a kind of relation uh, encodes. So plan is a kind of organism. But an invasive plant is not really a type, but a role, namely the 
specific plant that does something or has some kind of quality. And this quality may be time dependent, it may not be universal. So what might be called an invasive plant in one place is might be a house plant or even cherished as a decorative plant in another part of the world. So when a plant is always a plant, an invasive plant is not always an invasive plant. And this distinction between rigidity, types, and roles, non-rigid entities, has to be carefully incorporated in the top ontology. And this was done um, for the Kyoto ontology that I hope we can recycle for Sierra. Um, and it's, this, ontology, this distinction is especially important uh, when we deal with real texts or with applications such as tourism uh, de development. Um, because many new concepts come into the language that in fact are morals. Um, for the Kyoto domain, which was the environment, we had endemic species, threatened species, extinct species, which are all morals. And as I said, similarly, we expect this to be the case for the, for the Sierra domains. Um, my colleague Amanda Hicks, whom I already mentioned, and uh, my other colleague in Berlin, Axel Herold, developed a tool called Rudify for the automatic distinction between types and roles. And this tool is based on so-called lexical semantic patterns, little phrases, which you will see on this slide, that can identify whether the two elements X and Y in this phrase are in a type relation or in a role relation. So when you say X is an otherwise, that is usually, not always, but usually a type, whereas phrases like Y used to be an X or Y is considered an X identifies a role relation. So again, I hope that we can use this tool um, to build uh, the anthology uh, for Arabic. Um, Unify can be used, obviously, to identify uh, roles and types in documents and also to model them accordingly in the ontology, to extend the ontology. Um, knowledge in the ontology not only pertains to entities with respect to, say, types of roles, but also to processes, and in particular um, to processes that have certain temporal properties um, states that have long-term temporal properties, achievements and accomplishments that are sudden uh, uh, state of processes with a definite ending, and so forth. Um, so again, I won't have time to go into this, and I can get rather technical, but um, I just want to say that um, the Kyoto and the distinctions that allow one to um, identify processes with different general uh, properties. Um, the same is true for qualities. Um, Amanda Hicks has defined the qualities, indefinite qualities, which um, are yes or no, dead and alive, indefinite qualities, which have no um, clear uh, temporal limitation, and measurable quantities, such as spatial and uh, spatial dimensions height and weight, long, short, broad, wide, and so forth. Uh, qualities have also been modeled um, very carefully um, with regard to their properties, whether they're stable, whether their value can change, how they relate to other properties, such as tiny and small scalar properties, and so forth. Um, we also have other relations, such as entailment, uh, which is a kind of subsumption with respect to processes. If one process has been asserted, it may entail uh, another more general process. Uh, we have encoded participation, uh, participation, and as I already mentioned, temporal and spatial relations. Um, here is a, a quick uh, sketch of how uh, word nets, um, entities and words have been mapped to ontologies with specific relations. So relations for rigid entities are equivalent, subclass, and instance. And for non-rigid entities, the whole host of relations, such as within a domain, 
role playing, participant, participating in the state, co participant, and so forth. And there may be others. Um, this is subject to uh, further ontological development, but I think we have captured the most important ones that will allow us to perform accurate uh, reasoning over text. So there are still a lot of open questions. Um, one, of course, is one of graininess, how subtle or fine-grained, or conversely, how coarse-grained uh, a picture of um, the world, the language, ontology, and reasoning one wants to have. Um, and as, as always um, in research, <laughs> we will have to strike a medium ground. We want to make fine-grained decisions to draw important or sufficiently important distinctions. But the process always has to be manageable by um, automatic, has to be manageable automatically, and also by naive humans, because even though humans, of course, have an uh, amazing command of the huge lexicon, their reasoning ability um, is not that of a programmed computer or perhaps a robot. Um, and humans, as we know, are amazingly uh, inaccurate in their reasoning. Nevertheless, uh, we build our systems for human consumption and for human applications, so we have to keep in mind a certain level of naivete or perhaps coarse graininess. So that's really all I wanted to say. I went a little bit over time, but I hope I've given you an oversight of what we have done already. Um, what are the big questions that um, the Berlin partners are hoping to address? and also some of the work that we have done already and that we hope we can piggyback on um, for Sierra. So, thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, I would like uh, a question. Uh, what is the difference between uh, homonomy and subtype relation? So between that, homonomy and sorry, yeah. can you repeat that? So there was a question about is there any difference between homonomy and the subtype relation? In mathematical sense, I think you're doing this. Um, well, we don't, no, we don't draw a distinction. Um, we use these words interchangeably, just as we sometimes say is a, or hyperonomy and hyponomy. They're all kinds of words. Now, as I try, of course, as I tried to say, this distinction really hides several. So it hides the proper type, subtype relation, and it also includes the uh, role relation. And uh, actually something I did not mention that is encoded in the English word net is the instance relation, which uh, relates a named entity to a superordinate. So uh, Obama is an instance of a president, it's not a role and it's not a type, um, that is a third relation. And the instance relation, which I did not mention, um, always um, is characterized by the fact that all the instances are leaves, are terminal nodes in a tree. So I believe those three, uh, type, uh, role, and instance, are always somewhat sloppily <laughs> subsumed under the um, hyponymy relation. So, so maybe I extended myself uh, the question. Uh, I mean, is it mixed uh, because it's not understood or just by mistake? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah. Um, again, I think it depends who you ask this question. Um, the ordinary language speakers who are not, um, who don't know anything about ontology, will easily um, agree that uh, something is a kind of, or is a type of, to all three. They don't really are not sensitive to this distinction. And um, but an ontologist, of course, um, is. And um, I think for our purposes, it is important to draw these distinctions, as I try to argue, because um, role subtypes have certain properties that are very different from, from real types and proper types. And instances, as I said, are always named entities, 
which are another category that I use for to distinguish. So um, I think for our purposes, we must make these, must draw these distinctions. And I think Mustafa, you agree with me, and I hope everybody else in the room does too. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, actually, we try in the Arabic ontology to make, I mean, to make it like very clear distinction between the three actions. Yes, good. Okay. There is another question. Uh, um, can you tell us uh, a little bit more uh, how the Arabic word net was built? I will take the second question together, the third question. Professor Felber. From your experience with building the Arabic word net, yeah. what was the main challenges? Okay, Mustafa, can you repeat? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, uh, how did you build the Arabic ontology? Yeah, sorry, the Arabic word net. Yeah. And the other question was, what were what were the main challenges? For the Arabic, ah, the okay. Arabic yeah. Yes, um, I, I have to say um, from the beginning that I my knowledge of Arabic is very, very limited. And we had two native speakers did the actual lexicography. And then we had um, me as a WordNet expert, if you want, and then uh, people who are natural language processing and computational linguistics experts. Um, so we had really three different kinds of people stirring the pot and addressing different questions. Um, we uh, started by automatically identifying, in fact they had been identified before, uh, 10,000 target uh, concepts from the English WordNet that have also been encoded in many other WordNets including European WordNets. And we tried to identify those um, in Arabic, mostly manually, but also semi-automatically, and then build um, an Arabic word net that would contain um, these 10,000 or turn out to be 11,000 um, concepts. Um, we made local extensions so uh, that are Arabic specific. So I remember, for example, when we went to the um, family relations, um, I believe Arabic has many, many words for uncle and a very different kind of um, ontology, if you want, or different mapping from uh, kinship relations to the word uncle than English does. So we try to accommodate those language-specific um, uh, 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 things in, um, in the Arabic word and added them to the shared uh, 10,000 concepts. Um, but does that answer some of the question? So, or? What, what, what were the main challenges? I mean, did you stop the project? Are you going to continue? Ah, well, what was the, what was the biggest challenge? Um, actually, I understood that it was built manually, right? Yes, it was built manually, yes. So there was no some automation. I'm sorry? There was, there was no automation. No, but the extensions that I mentioned earlier, um, mm -hmm. uh, that are now currently going on in Barcelona, are done then semi-automatically. Um, so, but yeah, it was basically um, roughly a manual translation from the 10,000 English uh, basic concepts to the corresponding Arabic concepts. Um, well, some of the challenges were, um, as I already indicated, some mismatches, so things for Arabic did not have a word, um, or conversely, the Arabic had many more words that had to be, where the ontology had to be um, extended, uh, as in the case of, I believe, Ankur. Um So it was, I would say overall, I'm giving a very general answer here, but I would uh, say there were no challenges that cannot be overcome or that we feel, and I believe the people in Barcelona would agree, that we feel cannot be overcome. So it's a question of funding, as always, and this is why our project stopped. We had money for three years, and that was the end. Um, and uh, of course, a question of um, human resources. It's very labor-intensive to build a word net. Um, but scientifically, linguistically, or ontologically, um, I think we are at the point where we know what we want to do and how we want to proceed. So I do not see any major conceptual scientific challenges on, on that level. And I hope, I, I hope I'm right. Yeah, uh, uh, also actually, all, although we are in a hurry, but please allow me to ask a question about the Yoruba ontology. Yes. 
So I understood this is kind of a special ontology or special way of deed for the environment domain, right? Yes. And why this is not part of the web itself? Why, I mean, why did it ex just extend the senses or let's say the glosses or let's say the meanings and we have need to include it? Yes, that could, that's a very good question and that could be fairly easily done. So again, it's just a question of somebody sitting down and doing it. Um, <laughs> but it can easily be done, uh, as it can be done with any kind of other extension. And let me just add that many, many WordNet users who have specific applications in mind have built um, term databases, if you want, or terminological, very spe domain-specific WordNets, and have downloaded our WordNet and just simply attached their terminology to the appropriate nodes. So the same can be done for Kyoto and also for Sierra. Again, it's just a question of time and manpower. Actually, uh, for the purposes of the project, how, uh, the question, how, how big is the Kyoto ontology? And how many languages is, is, does it support? Um, but see, in Kyoto we had uh, English, of course, we had Dutch, Italian, um, and Spanish, I think. I'm embarrassed now to say, I, I think, yeah, I think it was Spanish. So we only had four or five languages, um, and um, but the number of languages that can be added are, of course, um, uh, open-ended. And the main focus really, from, from my point of view, or from, from the Berlin um, project, was on the development of the upper-level ontology and making those distinctions. And the lexical, that was the hard work. And I think my colleagues, especially Amanda Hicks, did an excellent job. And I think the attachment of um, or the mapping onto actual language um, is not so difficult once you get um, you have identified the uh, proper relations and uh, uh, know how to integrate um, the words um, of, of, of a domain of a domain lexicon. Okay, so uh, let me please. And um, because we have, we still have another presentation in the conference, and it's already we are too late. But uh, I believe, uh, Christiana, that we should uh, Skype may maybe in uh, Saturday because we have a project meeting. Yes, yes. We have like more technical questions regarding Sierra. Yes. And uh, we will be in touch. I think we need to. Uh, ask you more and also to show you like the other components that can be added to the uh, also to the project. Yes, um, I, yeah, I would very much like to see the other presentations uh, that were given today so I can catch up. Okay. And I will try to do that tomorrow and then on Saturday we can have a more um, technical and uh, forward looking so, so uh, discussion. You, so are you asking everyone to make me a presentation here to send you his slides? That would be lovely, yeah. That would be okay, very nice. Do. Or put it up on a website or, or whichever, share it in some way or another, yes. So please do, Carlo, can you please, everyone send the presentation, because you have the email over there, right? Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Christiana. Okay, thank you, and uh, I will be in touch. Yeah, have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. I am